start paying for this dim dim which is probably worth it maybe we can have more interactive session and then you know I can assign the microphone to you guys and you know we can talk because right now it's like you know I talk for two hours and I really don't get to gauge you know how you guys are feeling you know how the pace of the class is and where your challenges are so maybe you know I don't want to bother with Wimba maybe I want to see you know if I get the dim dim and subscribe to it maybe we can have a better uh, interactive session okay so hope everyone is having fun uh, doing the uh, assignment two which is due Wednesday but if you need a couple of more days that's fine because I will not be able to um, attend next Thursday because I'm in training on a Six Sigma project that I'm leading um, so I probably will need to do it on Friday um, sorry or on Sunday the following week okay <clears throat> So if you want to submit it by Friday, which is what I meant, it should still be okay. So I'll review the solution on Sunday. But if you get it done before Wednesday, that's that's better. Okay, so let's start today. Uh, just wanted to make sure I'm recording. So it's good. Um, all right. So today we backtrack. Today what we do is we start from chapter one of your book, a bioconductor uh, case studies. Uh, the way the book has been organized, I couldn't have started with chapter one because um, without introducing you to bioconductor and R, I wasn't sure how the authors expected that you would understand it. But anyway, it doesn't matter where it's put as long as we understand you know, what we try to do. So in chapter one of your book, it describes a data set called ALL data. And I have seen in the past, and even myself, when I'm trying to learn it, it's very important that we understand this data set very well. Because a lot of the examples that are in your book, um, and in many of the uh, examples you'll find on the web or Vignettes, uh, it's based on the ALL data. Uh, so if you do not understand this data set, it will be very hard for you to follow um, the example. So I make sure that you understand this data set very well. So once we do that, then what we will cover today is we will do some exercise, one with the multiple test package, which uses uh, FWER-based control, and then we'll review SAM, which uses FDR-based control. So this is you're controlling the error type, type 1 and type 2 error, which we covered when you're reading a lecture 3. But today we're going to go into the actual bioconductor code that how can we do something different than normal parametric uh, t-test. So we'll take you through those two examples. And I will have some slides so in case, just so we understand the theory behind those two a little more. Okay, so let's try to understand the ALL data, what it is. You will need to read the chapter one of your uh, text after I, my presentation, should you have more questions. So on a high level, this data set has 128 samples from 128 different individuals. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they all have uh, acute lymphovastic leukemia. Okay. Now, I don't know biology at all or enough, so I'm not going to get into the detail, but from what I understand, of this 128 um, uh, individuals who have this uh, lymph leukemia, 95 of them have the leukemia at their B cell, and 33 of them have them at the T cell. So one is B cell ALL, other one is T cell ALL. Of the B cell, which is 95 samples, there are a subset of subjects who happen to have a mutation called BCRABL mutation, which is also known as Philadelphia chromosome mutation, which is your chromosome 22, part of it has been exchanged with chromosome 9. So that results in a mutation, uh, and when this cross hybridization happens, that's called the Philadelphia chromosome. But overall, the mutation has been termed as a BCRABL mutation. So out of those 95 samples, subjects, right? Some of them have the ALL because it has been observed that they have a BCRABL mutation, and some of them don't have the BCRABL mutation but still have the ALL. So one of the goals for us is to understand how is this cancer 
affecting these patients when they either have this mutation or they don't have this mutation. Okay. And other than the BCR ABL mutation, you can also have cancer in the T cell, and they can also have a ALL1, A4 mutation. So when you look at the phenotype, and you, which you'll see soon, it's not only a differentiation between B cell and T cell type of ALL. You need to differentiate more to say whether they have this BCR ABL mutation or not, and whether they will have ALL effect. F4 mutation or not. And depending on that, you will try to have two control or two groups and you will see what's different between those two. For you to practice this, what you need to first do is make sure, and I, I'm pretty sure you already have done it, otherwise you wouldn't be able to do your homework too, which is you download the package from Bioconductor BioBase, which is the base package. And that was what we discussed in our web session 3 when I showed you guys how to create an expression set object uh, from, uh, uh, from scratch or rather from text file. So you should have this package already. Uh, but that's what you need to download first. So let me execute the codes and then you can follow it. So first thing I do is I, these data set ALL actually comes already with your BioBase base package. So anytime you do some analysis or maybe you have some publication that you're trying to do, and if you're referencing the ALL data, one of the way the bioconductor tells you is you have to cite give the citation or reference to the package that's used inside your code. So if you're ever using the ALL data for any demonstration purpose, make sure you do the citation BioBase. So for our need, uh, we need to have the BioBase package, which you do. And then you need to import the library ALL. So BioBase package comes with the ALL expression data object already. So we imported the library over here, as you see. And now we're going to call this expression set object, which is ALL, okay? and verify you know, what is the object that you just imported. So anytime you want to find out what is the class or the object that you just imported, you just do a class on it. So this is again an expression set object, which we went in big detail last week. I hate repeating myself, so it, sh it should be all there. And then you got it from the BioBase package. Again, ALL is an expression set object we had constructed at Web Session 3 from text files. Now let's look at this uh, particular object, the ALL expression set object. You can actually issue a command called show all. So here it's telling you this is your expression set object. So under this expression set object, that itself is built of several different objects, right? It's built out of asset data, which is basically a matrix of your feature versus sample and the intensity values. So I have 128 samples, and that's how I started when I started to describe you the experiment. So we have 128 samples, and in this particular uh, FA matrix chip, which is probably one of the first version or the older version, which is HGU95AV2 chip type. They only had 12,625 features. So asset data, so expression set object itself is, consists of asset data object, which has the intensity for the feature and sample. Pheno data tells you which sample belongs to which condition. And over here, you will see, since there are so many layers, that not only you're differentiating between ALL of B cell and T cell, you're also differentiating between BCR ABL mutation or not, ALL1, F4 mutation or not. So you will have a lot more uh, data under your pheno data and a lot more columns. So your pheno data will be a little more complex than the normal uh, homeworks or the experiments that you're going to analyze in this course. But it's very important that you understand what you're extracting out of your ALL data set. So that's the purpose of this uh, topic here. So again, it also consists of feature data, which it tells you the names of the features. And you can also have annotation about the feature. Then the experiment data object, which tells you how the experiment was constructed. And the annotation tells you the chip type, which is HGU95AB2, is simply a string. Now, one 
good thing about um, this expression set object, so if you look at the help file here, so maybe it should be put over here. So I showed you how to understand everything that you need to about the expression set object by issuing this help command. So let me do that one more time. Oh, I should not do that because it's going to take me out of dim dim. So I will not go, no, not do that. So if you do the uh, ex uh, expression set class help file over here, it will show you what are the how is the object constructed and what are the different methods you know that are applicable to this object. So this object is constructed of this one, constructed of this one, right? As a data, as a data itself is constructed out of a matrix object. Pheno data it's constructed out of annotated data frame object. Annotated data frame itself consists of data dot frame object. Featured data I think is a um, data dot frame. Experiment data object is also MIM ME type of object, right? So we all went over and uh, annotation is just simply a character vector. Just simply assigns annotation to the chip type. But you can also give more data to it or more description to it. In uh, those of you who have taken object-oriented programming, or if you haven't, the way you initiate an object or you construct an object from a class is by the new operator. So if you're constructing an expression set object, so you have to say new to all the sub-objects that you're creating. So this is the minimum object, which is just the matrix, which contains the feature and the samples data. Then you construct the pheno data object by new annotated data frame. You construct the feature data by new annotated data frame. Experiment data, as I just mentioned to you, is a minimum information about a microarray experiment type of object. So MIMEMEM, an annotated data frame, is actually constructed out of ESET object. Uh, that's in bioconductor. So in R, all you have base, the basic objects as we went from the first few sessions are vector, list, matrix, data frame, array, and etc. So when you constructed the first base class, which is eBase, right, I think, that annotated data frame is actually constructed out of data.frame. So it's a higher level object than data.frame. So MIAME is also a similar object that's created out of maybe a couple of data dot frame. So on the most fun, most bottom level, your bricks out of which you're constructing your house doesn't change. So you're basically either putting your window, which would be a list, your brick, which could be a matrix, your roof, which could be a uh, data dot frame, right? So you put all of those together, that becomes your house, which is the annotated data frame. It's just an analogy I'm trying to make. So object is built off on a high level, maybe on some other lower level objects. Those itself can be built out of the base objects that comes with your R programming language. I know it's hard if someone hasn't done object-oriented programming, but if you have done it, it's, it's a very simple concept. To look at the structure of any expression set uh, uh, or any object, you issue the str command, which is similar to show, but as S, uh, str actually gives you a much more detailed uh, breakdown of the object, and it will match to the exactly same when you constructed the expression set object from text file. So if you do an str all, so now you can see the structure of this object, which is expression set, so it's built out of asset data, right, which is a matrix. It's basically just rows and columns. On the rows, you have the features, which is the row name. And the column, you have the sample, which is the column name. And it's matrix, because all of them has the intensity value of, in, of, num, or, of numeric. Pheno data, so it's the base object is called annotated data frame. It has four slots, means four properties, right? So one is the uh, var metadata, then you have data, then you have dim label and class version. So when we created the expression set object, we did not have the dim label, which is sample name, sample columns, and class version. So that's something the ALL data has extended. But if you look, when we discussed the expression set object, we only had two slots. We talked about the var metadata, which is we described the samples in a more, more Depth. Remember, we talked about the gender, and I think uh, type and the numeric. Or the there was an um, I forgot score, right? The tumor progression. So we described the sample A to F in a little more depth. What A meant, what B meant, etc. So that's when we constructed the var metadata, which is also a data dot frame. 
and your data is the Fino data which is the same in our case we had only three columns as I was mentioning gender we had uh, uh, sorry, um, trying to remember. We had gender, we had type, and we had score. But for your ALL data, you have much more columns, as I'll show you very quickly. You have a column called COD, you have diagnosis, you have the gender, the age, uh, the BT, CR, and whether it had the uh, you know ALL type mutation or BCRABL type mutation, and some of the other future protein and kinet and CCR, you know, whether the patient relapsed or not. So anything that's relevant for that experiment, the investigators actually added it. So you always don't add on your pheno data, just, you know, say sample A, B, C, and either whether it's male, female, or whether it's drug or placebo. So that's the minimum information. Even gender, you don't have to care. At a minimum on pheno data, you can say if you have five samples or six samples, three of them is treated with drug and three of them treated with placebo. So you may have only one column or two column, right? So sample names and what condition they belong to. But in this experiment, because it's so much more complex, as I started saying that, you have to indicate whether what whether it has a what kind of mutation it has, what kind of proteins were involved in some of those um, cytogenic um, observation that they had, whether the patient relapsed or not. So all the relevant things that were important on the data dot frame. So each of these dollar is a column that was included on the data. So that's similar to the to the Fino data. So this is the Fino data. We already talked about VAR metadata and data in the last example. Additionally you are seeing here DIM label and class label. The feature levels also, it's the same thing. It talks about the 12,000 features that's available in that HGU 95AV2 array. And the VAR metadata describes the more about the features, but it actually, even though it's available, they did not construct anything here. And the class version DIM labels, that's something they have extended in the ALL data set. But in the BioBase package, when we looked at the expression set object, this dimension level and class versions were not used. Experiment data, I'm not going to go into detail, we will not use it, but you can look it up. It's the same thing, who did it, what's the contact, and what department, it's just to describe your, yourself. Annotation is very simple, it's just a chip type. And you know how the protocol was done, we did not cover it, but they also cre cre created another object to describe their protocol. It probably describes in, in how exactly the um, uh, experiment was conducted but I actually personally haven't looked in detail you know how the what kind of data the protocol data con, uh, consists so so I hope that you really get an understanding and I'm trying to emphasize it more and more I seem like I feel like a repeating drum but you know this is your base object these are the sub objects and other each of these objects what are the slots what are the properties what are the columns should be really clear to you by now I'm hoping Okay, so now um, each object that you create, you know, either has a slot or what also what we call property. So this object expression set has a property or slot of um, acid data has a slot of pheno data. It also has method. So method is is nothing but how you access some of these properties, which is similar to a function, right? So met method is, you can also say, is a procedure in how that comes with that object where you can actually access some of the slots. Um, so now, now that we have seen the structure and we have seen the different s slots that's available, one of the method that um, uh, your expression set object has, and you can actually find out all the method from by doing the help expression set class, and I I'm not trying to run this because uh, if I do run it, um, I'm going to get away from dim dim. But uh, okay, sorry, uh, Alex. Uh, I know why you lost me um, because I can only have one web web browser active at a time. I think I should be here, right? Okay. Okay, so now you should see, right? Okay. 
So if you if you do this help expression set class, it will very simply tell you what are the different uh, slots and what are the different methods. So one of the method on how you actually access the Fino data object, which is this one, let me highlight. How do you access the Fino data out of the your object expression expression set? You can you you can use p data, right? So this is one of the object that you have p data. Uh, sorry, method. Apology. So one of the method is p data. So inside p data as a parameter, you supply the expression set object, and if you do that, you'll see it returns to you on a table or format the Fino data object. Okay, so in this phenotype object, as I was mentioning, it's not just the gender and just you know whether it's treated by drug or not. It has a lot of descriptions. So I'm just showing you the first five samples. You can see there's a column called COD, which honestly I don't know what it means. I have to read the protocol description. So it describes you for these samples, you know, what is their gender, what are their ages, and whether it's a B cell, right? or whether it's a T cell. So within B cell, there's also differentiation, whether it's a B2, B4, B1, etc. Then on this particular column, pay special attention, mol.bio. This column tells you what kind of mutation they have. So subject 1005 has a mutation of BCRABL, which is the Philadelphia chromosome I talked about. Or let's say subject 4007 doesn't have any mutation. 4006 has the ALLFR4 mutation. So if you were to only select subjects out of this particular data set ALL who only have BCR ABL mutation, you'll probably write a code to say where the mol dot bio dollar mol dot bio is equal to BCR ABL. So if you do such a thing, only thousand five, three thousand two should return. So you have to know what exact column that you're referencing and what's going to be your condition. So for you to understand the ALL data, it is imperative that you understand what is the um, Fino data look like, what are the different columns, and what are the different columns are containing. You might be asked uh, in a homework to say, you know, I want you to do an analysis where the patient has actually relapsed, their cancer has relapsed, right? So for you to extract only those subset of patients where the relapse of the cancer is true, then you'll just say, you know, in your p data dollar relapse is equal to true. So in that way, you can extract those subset of subjects. So you can do analysis in many different ways. So it's very important that you organize your Fino data in a, in a fashion that I'm showing you here or the authors have showed you here. Then you can really leverage your experiment analysis. And you can do it many way or any way someone asks you or, the, or how you choose to. Enough on that topic. So now what I'm going to do is uh, I want you to extract out of these uh, ALL data set only those who has BCR ABL type mutation or ALL F4 mutation, right? So neg means that this subjects, they had cancer or leukemia, but they, they didn't have any of those two ob um, observed mutations. So you, so you will refer to Maldot bile and you'll only get either BCR ABL or ALL1 AF4. Okay, so I'm not sure. Um, oh, maybe um, I did not share the um, the sound microphone. No, microphone is on, but I see. Um, you know what I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to log back out. Uh, I'm going to log. I'm going to drop off and log back in, Alex. I'm going to. I drop out and log back on. Okay. Because I don't see how you Okay. So that's the problem with dim dim sometimes. I think I just did that and it navigated away from dim dim. Okay, so let me log back on. So, so I cannot show you any active web page when dim dim is on focus. <clears throat> OK. 
Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so it should be allow. Okay. All right, so Alex, you should be able to hear me now. And I'm sharing in a moment. Sorry about the disruption, guys. Been a long day. So I let me verify this. Okay, so I think you should be able to hear it, Alex. Okay, I think we're good. All right, so let me minimize this. Okay, so back to, sorry, everyone. So we are, um, so you have to be very careful, right, to understand your pheno data and what column that you need. So if you just simply do ALL dollar mol dot bile, right? So it just basically goes to your pheno data and accesses for all of your 128 samples who is BCR, who is negative, and who is ALL AF4. So now if I simply tell you that get me only those samples that has either this mutation or that mutation, your code is rather simple. Right? So you'll write that your ALL dollar mol is equal to either this string or the string that you want and pay special attention and I am sorry to be like this but I will ask you in homework why the first parameter is null here then I have a comma and then I have that why wouldn't I or didn't I write the code like this so how do you know to position this as a comma then a space versus space and a comma and I am not going to tell you now because once you can answer me correctly I have a very high confidence that you know how to subset and where a particular string should go but if you have a difficulty understanding that when we review it I hope it's more clear to you so as you see the first one is space here and there's a reason then there's a comma and then I am saying that in my ALL mobile when it's either of this condition is met. So let's do that. So it's very easy from a subset, you know, when you saw your ALL data to go to, from, a, from a main set of ALL data to get into a subset. So I did that. So now if you look at the summary and then P data ALL S1, right? And then I also want to break down a little bit more which I didn't do earlier. So if you do just the p data, um, sorry. 
So LLS1, and I don't want to do this kind of repeating going forward because at this now at a bare minimum, I want to un make sure that you guys are understanding or I am trying my best to explain you when we are transitioning from one code to another code and why it is. So the class, again, is the expression set object. But this AS ALLS1 is a subset of your ALL. And that's how I did the subsetting. So one of the questions I'll ask you in your homework is why did the I did the subsetting the way I did? Why space and comma and why not the other way? So that's the first thing. Then for this object, which is expression set, you have a method called pData, right? So by using the method pData, you can actually access the uh, the phenotype. And let me just show you the uh, first because there are so many samples. Let me just show you the first uh, few lines which I also did for the main data ALL, but here I'm doing it for the subset. So that's your pheno data here. First few 10 lines or whatever it is. Shows you all the column and the sample labels. So now, why do I do summary, right? So summary itself, so you should do a question of summary. What is summary? So what summary would do, it's, it's a method that comes with the R base package. So it will actually tell you under the age what are the distinct values. So if you have over here remission, relapse is true or false, the summary will tell you under this column you have a factor type of data where the level is true or false. So that's what the summary does. It summarizes the data type under each column. So instead of look, reviewing it this way, if you do the summary P data, it's a little better view or presentation. So now your each column got summarized, right? So it tells you for a numeric type, the summary will tell you what's the mean, median, and quarter, etc. And you already did that when you did your homework, the women data set. You actually did a summary, so it should not be news to you. Then on the remission side, it tells you, uh, sorry, relapse one, it will tell you uh, how many, whether it was a true or false, and you know, whether it was a factor. Um, Right over here is the logical, so it should be true or false. So the class type is logical and true or false, and out of which how many were true and how many are false. So it gives you just a better view. It's not something you have to do, but it's a neat way because it's, it's a tool for statistician. So they like to review your data in many different ways that's meaningful to them. So it's useful. So that's the difference between when you just reviewed the P data ALLS1 and summary. So when you look at this code, I we really wanted to understand to say what's the class that you worked with. What is P data ALLS1? Where did it come from? It didn't come from thin air. Someone have written it somewhere. So how do you know, you know, to use this P data? Again, this is a method. And you should be able to understand what methods are available by doing the help page on your expression set object. Then summary on top of the P data LLS1, summary itself is an R type of base object which summarizes the result of data type and its distinct factors and levels for under each column. So that's summary P data. So up to now, I showed you how to start with an ALL data set and how to get to a subset LLS1 based on the condition that I'm asking you. Okay. Now, I'm going to do something different totally. I'm going to, instead of doing my, uh, so let me show you the P data again. So what my initial data set was just ALL, right? So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to actually do my analysis on um, negative, right? Um, Right. On BCR ABL and negative. How about I subset those subjects that are BCR ABL and negative? Right. Earlier I showed you between BCR ABL and ALL1 A4. Now let's do between BCR ABL and negative. And let's analyze this two subset of subjects. So what I'm doing here, and this is a slightly different way of doing it. So over here I did the subset this way. Right. But I will show you a slightly different way how to do the same thing, but this time BCR, ABL, and negative. So I'm storing my pheno data that I have um, from the main, my parent data set or main data set. I'm just storing it into another object called PDAT. Sorry, just, just storing it into PDAT. So now if you look at the PDAT, it should be your original data set, the pheno data. Same thing. I haven't done anything magical here, just swapping things from one to another. 
So I still have my 10 SCR samples, BCR samples. So ideally what I should get now going forward, I only want these 37 samples from here and 74 samples from here. So how do I do that? So the way to do that, and this is how you'll find on your textbook, I find the subsetting much easier, but as I said, there's many ways to do same thing in a programming language. So grep, you know, this is a regular expression. If you have taken Perl and others, you should really understand this very well. So what I want is I want BCR, ABL, and negative, and um, and what I also want, which is little, I'm making things a little more complex for you. What I also want is I only want those BCR, ABL negative or negative samples who has only B cells. I don't care about T cell. So let's assume you know you had a subject who was negative, but that negative could be due to T cell because earlier I said the BCR ABL mutation only happens on B cell. So if you pick BCR and ABL, yeah, so you'll get B3, B2, B1, B4. But the negative also can apply to your B cell and your negative can also apply to your T cell. So if I'm picking up BCR ABL for B3, B2, B1, and B4, I cannot pick the negative for, for any of those T. So what I want to do, I also want to use this BT column. And the way I would do that is I want to make sure the grep B, which is a regular expression, caret B means it starts with the B, right? Starts with the B. That's the caret B. So it'll always start with the B. It can end with 2, 3, or whatever. So that's my regular expression, caret B. P dat dollar BT. So P dat is the object I just stored, my Fino data. So P dat dollar BT means this column. So in my P dot dollar BT or in this column anything that starts with a B, right? And I want to intersect that with this particular column, which is mole dot bile, would be either BCR ABL or negative. So in a way, it's very elegant and beautiful. You really, I really appreciate the way things happen here because you're treating two columns. You're saying in this column, I want it to be BCR ABL negative, and I want to intersect that with this column where things only start with B. And that's what this particular code is doing here. Okay? So that's your subset. I think I have pasted something. Yeah, okay. So this subset should still be an expression set, right? Sorry, sorry, it should be an intersect. Uh, and then you will actually, and let's look at subset itself. If you want to look at the first few columns of this. So these are the samples. So either your first sample, second sample meets the criteria, third sample, fourth sample doesn't, it's not, a fifth sample meets the criteria, right? So now, out of, again, it's not the first one. See, I'm again doing the second one. So now that I know from my subset which of those integer value or the sample meets my criteria or the row number, I can actually get the subset for AL. And in this subset, you will see it will only be BCR, ABL, and negative type of samples, and it will only be B set. So I did two joining here, right? I I did a criteria on BT and I also did a criteria on mole.bio. And I stored that into an index and based on that index I can then now get to a lower sub to a to a subset. So that's the subset. So now let's show it. And uh, so now I'm down to 79 samples. I started with 128 features. And if I want to show you the Fino data now of this, you can see that there is no ALLB4 samples, no NUP samples, it's only BCR, ABL, or negative, so mole.biol, it worked fine. And in my BT, there is no T cell, right? And no B, because it has, my regular expression was, it has to start, uh, and a B cell, 
right? So that's some regular expression. It has to start with a B. So you make sure there's no T cell now. T is zero. All you got is Bs, and you got BCR, ABL, and negative. So that's the good mental jump you need to make, that you started with ALL data set that had all type of data, Bs and Ts, and, neg and ALL, F4, and NUP, P, protein 98 mutation, etc. But now if you are asked, let's say in your homework, to do an analysis just between um, BCR and negative, you know how to subset the data by using the command that I just showed you here. Okay. So, so that pretty much quantifies the ALL um, a data set so on chapter one. So you can go back and read chapter one. So now what I want to do is I want to show you what is a non So I want to show you a whole analysis. Like now that you've subsidized your data, um, how do you uh, go on in carrying some t-test and uh, uh, other things to show me that out of those uh, 79 samples and 12, you know, 12,000 features, you know, what's meaningful? What's the differential expression? The first thing that you do is you do a non-specific filtering, and the reason that you do non-specific filtering is most of the genes, you know, do not have a differential expression. They will have similar values, and that can be ignored. So even though now you started with your BCR, ABL, and negative 79 samples and 12,000 feature, there is no point running a t-test or some kind of param, you know modified t-test, uh, moderated t-test on all your 12,000 features. So if you know that many of the genes, so let's say 50% of the genes, you know, are not differentially expressed, you might as well just get rid of it. So you cannot get rid of it based on an intensity value. That also doesn't make sense. You cannot say that in this experiment, I want to get rid of things that less than 100. Because, you know, from experiment to experiment, even between array to array, the intensities are going to be different. And you, you will normalize, they'll still be different. So you don't want to get rid of those genes that are not differentially expressed based on intensity. So one concept that you can use is uh, standard deviation or IQR. And I can explain the IQR and standard deviation very easily. So when you have a sample, two samples, right? And let's say you have uh, uh, two features. And if they are the same value, let's say one of them is 2, another one is, let's say, 1.9, they're very close to each other. So if two values are very close to each other um, across the samples, I'm just giving you a very simple example of one sample. But let's say you can be have four samples in one condition and another four sample in another condition. So if all the four values in one condition is very similar, or close to the other four values of another condition. So the standard deviation of those four values uh, bet between those two samples are going to be very small. If you have a high variability between the sample values, then you're going to have a very high standard deviation. Right? Simple concept. So if you think of it that between your two sample type, those features that have a very low standard deviation, you can just get rid of it. And there's a criteria, and in your chapter, you'll, you'll see in your homework, next homework that's coming, you'll have to do it based on standard deviation or rho SDS, or you can also do it based on IQR. So IQR is, uh, so I'm saying here that you can ignore if standard deviation between features are low. So then you have to quantify what do you mean by low? Is it 0 0.1, 0 0.2, what it is? So once we get into the code of rho SDS, we'll walk through one of those examples of how to do it based on standard deviation. Here I'm doing it by IQR, which is interquantile range. And you can look up the definition in Google, the tons of things on it, which is the distance between the 75th and 25th percentile of the data. Okay, so the simple concept of IQR is the greater the IQR or the distance. So let's say you have some data at the 75th percentile, the value of it is 200, and the data that's on the 25th percentile, the value is 25. So the difference is 175. So the greater the distance is, that means the higher the variability. Okay, and less the distance is, that means your data is less variable. Okay, so the greater the IQR, more spread you will have have between your two data points. So if your IQR is small, that means you have less distance. That means you have low variability. 
so that you can get rid of. So if it's low variability, then you can automatically conclude that for this particular gene between condition 1 and condition 2, there is no differential expression. So again, it boils down to the fact that I don't want to bother analyzing all 12,000 features when I know about six or 7,000 of them have low variability or low IQR or low RCTS. That's all I wanted to mention so far. One of the library that you will use to do this non-specific filtering, and this should be in page 85 of your Bioconductor textbook, is called Library Gene Filter. Right? So let's load this library. <clears throat> So I loaded it. Now, you can use many different things, right? You can use IQR or rho SDS. So over here, R already has a function built in how to calculate IQR. So if you supply a value range of X, right, into your IQR, so it'll already calculate this for you. So you can write this function, F1. And this criteria that I have is greater than point in the range of IQR, the distance is greater than point in. This is something arbitrary. So this is what we have seen has been recommended in micro experiment that you use something greater than 0.5 or greater than 0.7. <coughs> Just like p-value, there is no magic number. It doesn't have to be 0.05 or 0.01 for p-value. The same way your IQR, no one has written down, has to be greater than 0.8. I, I would challenge, why not greater than 0.5? Why not 0.75? So these are one of those parameters that you have to adjust and you have to play with it to see you know, what value that you put here makes sense. So this is just a recommended value, but always ask yourself why this, but why not something a little lower or something a little higher? So that's how I first write the function here, IQR greater than 0.5. And the gene filter function that actually comes with the filter fun function, right? So this filter fun function will actually then apply those IQR and rho SDS to, uh, uh, to get rid of those uh, features that has low variability, meaning low IQR or low um, rho SDS. So in this F1 right now happens to be an IQR based function you can very well do a rho SDS based function, which you will do in your assignment. But here I give you an example of the IQR. So you supply the F1 parameter here, which is an IQR based function. So what you are actually using or, or telling your gene filter to use uh, is the IQR 0.8 greater than 0.10 based filter criteria. So now the filter criteria has been established. You actually use another function called gene filter. In this gene filter, you supply your expression set object, which is the subset. Remember, ALL S1, you got from ALL. But this is only now 79 samples, which contains the BCR ABL and negative. But it still has the 12,000 features. Now you want to apply the non-specific filtering on ALL S1 based on FF, which is IQR. So all this can be done for you by the gene filter function. So you don't have to reinvent or write your own program. And that's why we're all using Bioconductor here. So once you do that, that returns a selected for you. So if you look at the selected, so this would, I think it's a true or false Boolean type. Right. So it tells you that so you have 12,800 features. So what selected is now telling you that your first feature, or 1,080, falls, means it does not meet the criteria of greater than 0.10. So this a particular probe set or this particular feature has a low variability. It has an IQR less than 0.8. So you don't want to bother analyzing this feature anymore. So all these five features, you will actually see since it's false, you can actually get rid of. But this feature, 1580, is currently true because it has an IQR of greater than 0.8. So that's the, you know, selected. So how many features now, and when you do a sum, it only returns the number of true. So you started with 12,600, right? So now you actually reduce your gene set from 12,000 to only 1,697. That's a big jump. So that's what I mean. The majority of your features across the experiment does not show in differential expression. It's only a minority of them. And the first step for you to identify that minority is to understand their variability. And the way you do that is not by some threshold or some intensity value, or but by a measurement of that 
standard deviation or the IQ are base distance. So you can use one or the other. So now you're down to 1697. So how do you get, so you started from LL, right? So you went to LLS1. So now how do you get into that subset or selected, right? Whatever it may be. How do you get into that selected that will have 1697? So you again do subsetting, right? So the way you do the subsetting now then is ALLS2 selected comma. So now remember when we did the phenotype, I did comma something, right? So if I if I go up and I show you, when I did this subset here of the phenotype, I did space comma subset. So now I am going to subset my features. Right? But I'm doing selected comma. So it's the other way. So I'm going to ask you in your homework, why am I doing comma select, why am I not doing comma selected, but in this scenario I'm doing selected comma. So this is a mental mapping. I want to make sure that you can make and understand. Just don't, even, because otherwise you will be doing things blindly. I'm not saying you will be, but some people had. But so you have to exactly know where goes what. Why not the other way? So now your selected is true and false. So in this case, when you want to do the second subset, so right now you want to actually get to LLS2, which should only have 1697 feature. And the way you do the subsetting this time is you put the selected on the first position, then you, could, then you give comma and everything else. And remember, you know, I'll give you a hint. When you have a matrix, let's say it has a column A, B, C, and D. So if you want to access the first element in the first column, right, so you will probably say a comma, something like that, right? And uh, we did that in the homework. If you want to get the third uh, the column, right, so you may want to do the position third. So think about it in matrix, you know, how do you get the first position, how do you get the second position, how do you get the, you know, third position, etc. So in this case, uh, I will do from the first position, which is ALLS2, A1. So now, it should contain the 1697 features that you're talking about. So if you now look at ALLS2, you will see you still have 47 samples, but you have 1697 features. So now comes the point of in your pipeline to do a t-test. So in the past, when we talked about, we talked about t-test, which is a parametric t-test, right? And I think the homework that you are doing, and if I'm not incorrect, you're actually doing a full change, and you're also doing a t-test, which is assuming a normal distribution. So we talked about that how statisticians actually do not uh, think that it's the right approach to, under, to assume that everything has a normal distribution, which it doesn't. So in that case, the assumption is incorrect. So the p-value that you're getting out of your t-tests are probably incorrect too. And full change also you cannot rely a lot. So I think what I need to do now, um, so we have 7 o'clock about. So maybe, maybe for 10, 12, 15 minutes, let me show you a few slides that talks about you know, how do you do this multi-test, which is the uh, an adjusted FWER, or uh, family-wise error rate control. So FWER for the Bonferroni connection, remember when I talked about chapter 3, you multiply it by number of genes. So that actually gives you a very small p-value, and when you get something like that, you actually lose the power. Uh, because the number of features is so high, you hardly get any feature that, that will have um, that many, um, uh, you know, that low of a p-value when you multiply that existing p-value with uh, 12,000 something or 23,000 something. So multi-test package in Bioconductor uses a methodology that actually is slightly or a better correction than Bonferroni. So I, and I think I remember very, uh, strongly that we talked about it's all about adjusting the p-value. So your t-test uh, starts with uh, p-value, then you want to control your type 1 or type 2 type of error. So when you want to control the FWER or family-wise error rate, so that's a control. So all that you will do, it you will take your p-value and you will actually lower it or adjust it. 
So different methodology, different packages are available. So today, from bioconductor perspective, we will review two packages. We'll review the multi-test package, and we will review SAM, uh, significance analysis of microarray package. So let's review some slides, just so I can give you a little more background. And they're all uploaded um, in your uh, Blackboard, so you should be um, able to go back and review them. So one is gene expression statistics. This is a wonderful slide. Um, I re and there's 108 slides of them. And I strongly recommend that you go through all of it from page 1 to page 108, OK? So what is the so so this is the notation right so t is the average log expression in tx means treatment so let's say i have uh, some samples where i have treated it with let's say with a merck drug right and c's are those samples or that were treated with placebo so i'm trying to understand you know for this particular disease criteria how does the drug that merck developed is working versus if the patient was simply one placebo and S is a standard deviation. So one method that you already know is you can just simply compare the full change of a particular um, uh, a gene or a feature uh, between what's in the drug experiment and what's in the control. So if someone had a um, the gene expression value here, let's say of log base, whatever, it's 5, and the control is 3, so your full change is 5 minus 3, 2. So since we do not want to rely on full change, and your, there are slides that will show you, you know, why you don't want to do that, you want to go into the variability of test statistics. So all you do in that case, you actually divide it by standard deviation. So what it is, there is a beautiful concept called signal over noise, right? So what T minus C is, is just a signal. But you cannot just take the signal as it is, because there could be some noise in your experiment because of which you are getting the signal. So you want to divide the signal by the noise factor. And in this scenario, the noise is the variability. So once you divide your signal by the noise, you get a corrected signal. And then now you are questioning yourself now, is that, does that make sense? Is that the signal that's corrected make, that, that should lead me into believing that there is a gene expression ongoing? So think of simple things, right? So you have a signal that says 2, right, value of 2. And you have no noise. Your noise is, let's say, 1. So you're very happy with that signal. So it's 2. But if you have a signal of 2 or noise or standard deviation of 4, right? It's a high variability, but you have a signal of 2. So 2 divided by 4, which is 0.5, is a much lower signal than 2 divided by 1 when your noise is low. So signal over noise is all you need to remember, that if you have low noise, your signal is good. If you have a high noise, you don't have a good signal. So now the question is, from the statistician's point of view, how do you calculate the noise? The most simple way to calculate the noise is by test statistics or, 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 uh, or assuming a normal distribution where you'd you know, take just the standard deviations of one sample, another sample, and divide it by the number of sample. So that's uh, the student T test developed in 1800 something, someone working in Guinness Brewery, right? Fisher. So now, since then on, for the last 200 years, you know, statisticians are trying to come up with more clever ideas to adjust the noise. So today we'll talk about SAM. The SAM actually c calculates the S0, which is the noise that is the overall estimate of all the genes in, in your um, experiment. And I have other slides that will show you how the overall things are calculated. So all you are doing here, whether you're doing a Bayesian, whether you're doing a SAM, or whether you're doing a um, multi-test uh, uh, FWR control, all you are trying to do is you're trying to adjust this S, right? And so you are getting a better and better noise estimation, so you can have a better and better confidence on, on your signal. So, so this slide says a lot. So before you get into reading in a much bigger depth, Try to understand the signal and noise concept. Let's get to the other um, other slides. So let's go through this one quickly, maybe for the next 10 minutes. Again, as you do more uh, uh, analysis on bioconductors and others, you should already know, and I already memorized these names, um, and they are the ultimate gurus in, in this field. 
So this is your goal, right? So you have uh, data, let's say not that much N or samples, um, maybe 100 samples. It's costly. You know, just think about it doing an experiment with 100 subjects. That's going to cost you tons of money. And you have lots of features. You can have up to 23,000 features or genes. And uh, for the experiment I'm showing you, you have 12,000 of them. And there are many ways you can have this combination. You know, I personally cannot uh, understand uh, three dimension very well. So I don't know how I'm going to describe you P dimension. But um, maybe that's a topic of a separate class. So there are many ways to classify, uh, infinite ways to so show the difference between, let's say, you have two samples, which is drug treated, and another two sample that's not drug treated. And then you throw in the dimensions of all these features. So there are many ways to separate the data. right? And then I recommend you take a machine learning or neural network class to understand in a bigger depth you know, what the dimensions and hyperplane and things like of that nature is. So what you want to do is you want to actually um, not worry about all those 12,000 genes. That's just what I just showed you right now, which is non-specific filtering, right? So what you want to do is you know that most of the genes actually do not show differentiation uh, between uh, one condition to another. So I just took you through the IQR, and I talked to you about rho SDS. So what you want to do there? is you want to do a non-specific filtering. So that's what it's talking about. The first step is reduce the data. Don't worry about 12,030 or 23,000. If majority of them have low standard deviation, write a function either based on standard deviation or on IQR. And greater of those, that doesn't have any variability. And you saw how I reduced the data set from 12,000 features to roughly 1,600 features. So that's what data reduction is talking about. Then um, we assume that our data is parametric or normal um, uh, distribution. But um, when I am taking it to a next step, my assumption, which is the signal and noise concept I talked about, I will no longer comfortable with the noise that just assumes the standard deviation of S uh, with T test. So I want to do a non-parametric or permutation of, of that nature. So I want to make my more adjustment to the noise. So what you, when you do that, so what happens, your noise becomes louder the more you want to think about it. So your signal gets lower. Right? So it's an optimization factor. So when you want to do certain things like that, where you want to you get your t-test or you get your p-value, and you want to further lower it, right? So if initially you had 10 genes that showed up with p-value of 0 0.05, now you're coming up with all these techniques where the p-value from 0 0.05 to now is 0 0.01, you may have only three genes. So that's what I mean by losing power. So the more criteria that you put in, uh, the more you want to think about the noise, uh, the, the more power that you lose, and hence the ability to discriminate. So. Um, so instead of thinking of one gene at a time, the next step that we want to think about is aggregation or information. How do we learn information across the genes? So two things. One is the full change, just p-value. So p, with p-value, uh, genes are deemed to be interesting if observed p-value is suitably small. right? So that's one of those things. So in the p-value concept, we set up a criteria, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, whatever you want to do. And full change, we want to see, is it two full change? Is it one and a half five, one and a half full change, etc. So those are some of the criteria that we're talking about, a strategy on, our, on how to subset our data. And, but the biologists have long recognized the failure of a p-value to compensate for the size of the effect, which means when you think too much about the p-value, which is you're rather more focused on the noise, then you actually lose the signal. So from the biologist perspective, they're saying, you know, I'm clearly seeing a full change. Maybe I just want to run this experiment on all those genes that has a two-fold change. And that's how I want to go for it. So that's the biologist maybe taking that approach. But when the p-value is contrary strategy, where you want to think more how to reduce that uh, signal, and you are focusing more on the noise. So it's a contrary strategy. That's why it talks about full change versus p-value. 
So over here, when we did the t-test, remember, we always do that gene by gene, right? So for each, so we take each feature at a time or each gene at a time. And so let's say you have four sample on drug and four sample on the control. So you've, you calculated the t-value for each gene based on sample A and sample B. So you're going from one by one. So when you do that, you actually, by the time you go from the first feature to the second feature, whatever you did in the first feature is not relevant anymore. So one of the biggest problem of a parametric t-test is you are not taking into consideration of the analysis that you did for your feature one into feature two. But that's a big problem because, you know, those of you who know the biology 10,000 times better than me, you know, for the regulation and how the gene works, it's not quite the same. Because you may have a gene 1 or a transcription factor, and that could actually be doing um, some regulation on the gene B and gene 1 and, oh, sorry, a pr um, or rather I should say the proteins. So protein 1 and 2 then will regulate the protein 3. So there's always a dependency. In real life, you just cannot look at the measurement of protein A. That probably doesn't mean anything. That probably is related of how much transcription factor was there and how much inhibition or, or, or trigger that happened from the protein A that actually influenced the protein B, right? So in biology, you always have interdependencies, but in... Uh, p-value test that you're doing, it doesn't care. So you're losing information. They're losing the within group variability. So that's a very critical thing. So then they want to actually further modify that. So statisticians now want to understand that rather than estimating within group variability over and over again by each gene, which is what we do in a normal parametric t-test, you want to learn from similar genes. So these are all the authors that have come up with this adjustment. So today we'll review the SAM from Tusher et al. So you want, if you want to read the paper, Google it. and. Uh, we also have Lima and Smythe much later in our course by Lecture 7. We'll talk about linear modeling. But today we'll talk about Tusher and all, and uh, I'm forgetting the name of the other author, but I'll come to that very soon. So we'll review SAM and multi-test, which is, again, more thoughts about you know, how to correct uh, your noise. So if you remember the first uh, the, the slide that I showed you here, and let me go back for a second. So SAM is actually correcting the signal by S and S0. So what is this S0? And this S0 is actually explained rather well here. See, it's an, it's an overall estimate of the variance. So S itself, when you looked at this S, and let me go back here again, this S is a gene at a time, which is the parametric t-test. So you go from feature 1, to feature 2, and each time the S is changing. But this S0 is actually an adjustment of the overall estimate of the standard deviation of all the genes across your array versus the gene, which is the S, that you're, that you're treating at that, at that time, at that point in time. And how the S0 is calculated, uh, if you go back to... Uh, which I will not be able to cover today. And this should be covered in um, your stat statistics class, um, which is the exchangeability factor, or S0, and how the algorithm works and how the permutation works. How, so this S0 is actually configured. You can see from page uh, 30 uh, to 34. Right? So this actually gives you the algorithm of the exchangeability factor, or S0, uh, calculation. So what, uh, 714, I don't want to spend too much time, maybe one more minute. So that's uh, S0. So that's so bo bottom line is p-value correction. And this is a good one, right? The problem is we have very many tests, many, many ways to do that. There is a whole industry, right? For the last 200 years, the, the statisticians have tried to come up to correct the p-value correction. But the more correction that you try to do, the more power that you lose. So one of the solution could be you don't want to test the whole 12,000 gene sets or 2,000. Maybe you want to, based on your experiment, maybe you only want to analyze maybe few gene sets. And I know at Merck event, you know, there are groups that are, let's say, when you're studying diabetes, and all they're studying is the PPAR uh, uh, gene. 
proteins. So maybe that's something, you know, when you are doing research, you, you're not concerned about hundreds of genes because that's too much. So if you test many more directed hypotheses, but fewer set of genes, the less correction that you'll need to do, and uh, so it will give you the better results. Uh, so, okay, sorry. So the malt tea test package, the name wasn't coming to me, so SAM was by Tusher and all, and the malt tea test package that we're going to re review right now, it's by K. Pollard and Sander Dodoet. Right, so this is again the similar uh, uh, to uh, FWER Bonferroni connection that we saw, but the Bonferroni is too simple, where you're just multiplying by number of features, and you end up with such a small p-value that you don't get any any uh, feature out of it. So K. Pollard and Sander Didoet worked on it. It's and it has two parameter two procedure process by which you can calculate or adjust the p-value. One is called the min p. And another one is the max T methods. And both of them are to control the type 1 error. And the type 1 error we already talked about in the, in the past, which is FWER. Okay. So you have F, and, and, that, and this we will go through, you know, how you do that uh, one. So let's, we don't have to talk about it right now. Uh, so an FDR compared to the FWER is the false discovery rate. So in FWER, on layman's term, you can say that I will tolerate 10 mistakes or type 1 error, false positive, right? Or FWER will be proportionate, which will say I will tolerate 2% mistake of the 100 genes that, that you are telling me are, are true positives. So FWER is number best. You define the number ahead of time. In FDR, you say the percentage. So that's your threshold criteria. So, so that's all that I wanted to cover from the slide wise. And we have 45 minutes. Maybe uh, that should be sufficient to go over the multi-test and SAM. And that's how your homework will be. You'll start with the data set of, my cho of um, our choice. And then you'll analyze it first by multi-test. Then you'll analyze it by SAM. And you'll compare your result. So in the ALL data set, it's actually already coming as normalized. So one additional thing that you have to do is the cell files that I'll give you for your homework. You have to use RMA or GCRMA or MASS5, right? Whatever I ask you to request you to rather, sorry for the language, request you to. So you will actually do the normalization, summarization that way. You will have to do it non-specific filtering by using a row SDS, if not IQR. And then one of the pipeline would be analyze the data set by using FWER or multi-test package, where I can tell you, out of your 100 genes, I will tolerate five errors. See how many you get. Another pipeline will tell you, out of your 100 genes, I will tolerate 2% error. So let's do it by FDR. Let's use SAM. So, so that's, that's the next step that uh, you have to do for your uh, assignment 3. So now let's get back to what you're interested, which is the code in how we will do that. And remember this line over here. And when you re read the Vignette, of your of this package multi test uh, some of the theories behind what's mean t max t should be more clear to you but uh, that process and that method i leave you to read the paper paper by pollard and dandoy but today we'll cover the max t method in the homework i might ask you to the mean p but again you have to study the vignette to understand what's the difference between these two methods and for the theory you have to read the paper and which i will already upload uh, in, in in blackboard and sam we already talked about the uh, s0 correction which was uh, the uh, sort of exchangeability factor and i showed you the s over s0 and there are some concepts of d test here um, uh, and D parameter, but uh, let's go through the examples and probably it will be much easier for you to follow. Okay. So this file, diff expression.ppt, and especially um, gene expression statistics from slide 1 to slide 108, and how multiple test itself works, right? These three slides, I, it is in, in Blackboard, and I highly recommend that you take a step back and before you jump into your code, you study these three slides. I have to acknowledge that I'm not a statistician, so explaining a lot of the statistical background has been a challenge for me, and it still is. 
I'm not the best person from whom you should learn statistics. So I try my best. Um, I, but in lack of anything else for you right now, and if you have additional question, go back and read these three slides. And if there is a slide or a section of a slide that you are unable to understand but you're curious to know, please reach out to me and I'll try to explain it. And if I cannot explain it, I'll ask a statistician friend of mine who can explain it for you. So don't forget about these slides when I show you. You don't have a final exam. I know it's an easy class, but don't forget the resources because if you don't understand it the way you should or you don't have interest, uh, you'll just basically then lose interest at the end of the day and this will not be worth the class taking. Okay, so we and sort of stopped right here, right? So this is up to the point where we did the... Uh, non-specific uh, filtering. So we have 47 samples, which is either BCR, ABL, or negative. So out of your 128, we did this. And our 100, 1,697 features did not meet uh, the ones that met the IQR criteria of greater than 0.8. So now on top of this now, we're going to apply in one pathway the uh, MIN-T, sorry, MAX-P or the FWER from multi-test package. And another pathway at the end of the class uh, session today, we'll show you the SAM, how you do the FDR-based control. So this is the multi-package that you need to uh, upload uh, from Bioconductor. So this is for controlling type 1 errors, that is controlling the false positive errors. So the two methods, min and max, so the mt.maxp returns p-value, so this is nothing but adjustment of those p-values, right? You lower it. What's the methodology? What's the theory? You have to study the paper by Sander Dodoy. So first thing that we do is we load the library multi-test, right? And you should know by now how to get a particular library from Bioconductor. And um, you have to tell the multi-test package, so you have 47 samples, right? Out of your samples, which are the ones that are bcr bill and which are the ones that are negative? What multi-test package does, it's basically a permutation method. Remember when we talked about from parametric tests, we went into how to control and get out of that uh, assumption of normal distribution and how you adjust the p-values is you permutate your samples. So in the multi-test package to work, to understand the level of theory that you need to, is you need to tell first this package what sample belongs to what condition. Once you tell that, the package is going to do a permutation and then come up with an adjusted p-value. Okay, So if you look at AL2.mol itself, right? so that's that. You have 47 samples. So out of it, which of them are BCR ne neg ABL negative? To do that, you'll just do a condition like that. So some of them will be true when it's a BCR. Some of them will be false. So what you want to do then is you want to convert this logical data type into numeric. So when it's true, it should be 1. When it's false, it should be 0. So now if you look at your CL, which is class label, when something is true, it's 1. So you have 1 and 1 here. False is 0. So, so in order for you to do the multi-test package, all you have to remember is this three parameter. And these are the areas you will find in some sections Bioconductor is so easy that as long as you know what are the parameters and what you need to supply, you are gold. You just you cannot do a mistake here. So all you have to do for your homework, there are three parameters. The first parameter has to have the expression set object. So ALL AS2 is an expression set object. Out of this expression set object consists of asset data object, it consists of uh, pheno data, and etc. On your first parameter over here, only thing that you'll supply is your asset data or the minimal cell object. The way you do that is you cast your ALLS2 to EXPRS. Once you do that, it doesn't care about the pheno data and experiment data and protocol data, all that. That's irrelevant. All you want to supply in the first parameter is your matrix or your asset data, which has the rows of features and columns of samples and the intensity values. So that's the first parameter. 
Second parameter, you're going to supply the, cl the class labels, which I show you here as CL. So when it's BCR ABL, it's 1. When it's not, it's 0. So 1 is 1, and the other was 0. So what it's going to do, so once it knows the original class label, it doesn't care whether it's BCR or XYZ, whatever. It's, it's either class A or class B. So in, in its permutation, if this particular sample right now is class 1, so in another permutation, it will be 0. In the third permutation, probably it's 1, but the second one is 0. So it will just permutate that. And I already gave you this example when I reviewed uh, Chapter 3. And since nobody asks any question, I think everybody follows this class much better than I can explain. So I'm very comfortable there in lack of questions. And b equals to 1,000 means I want to permutate this uh, 1,000 times. So these are the three parameters. So in your homework, I might tell you how many exact times you need to permutate. Your expression set object over here that's coming will depend on how it ends up. So remember, you have to first start with your cell file. You have to put it in your working directory. You have to then uh, read AFI or some kind of package to read the data, which will construct an expression set object. Then you have to use some kind of RMA or GCRMA method to normalize background coding and summarize. Then you have to do some gene filter to get rid of the 10,000 or whatever genes that doesn't meet the IQR criteria. Then you finally come down with an expression set object, which you have to cast to get only the matrix portion, and that's what will end up coming here. So all this that you'll do work upstream will end it up in downstream right here. And if you do any mistake on the upstream, none of this will work. But in this class, the easy thing is we go step by step, block by block. So once you know how to put, read, and normalize the data, you should not have any problem in the next assignment to do the gene-specific filtering and this uh, multi-test based package, uh, whatever, right? And once you have no problem in doing the permutation and multi-t package, you shouldn't have any problem figuring out what is the annotation, what pathway does it map, uh, and some other few other things and techniques that we'll show you later you know, for hypergeometry testing and whatnot. That's yet to come. So it all builds by block by block. So once you understand how the first set of blocks work, you can put it to the second block. Second block goes to the third block, which is what we called is workflow. So if you're interested and if you're listening, try to take a look at some workflow um, softwares like Pipeline Pilot, um, the, uh, by Acceleris, there is also NIME, it's a German open software. I'm very tempted to assign that as a project work, but I don't know if anyone will take it up. But there are plenty of jobs out there, people looking for pipeline pilot or K9 type of workflow. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people waiting to hire you if you have those skill sets. So anyway, much on that. So there are three parameters, right? So that's So we supply all of them. And we get, um, it's going to do the analysis. And that's the core of what's happening at multi-test here. So I did the permutation 1,000 times. And the object that it returns and stores it, I think it's a frame object, right, data frame object. So let's look at it. Oops, sorry. So let's look at uh, this uh, frame object. What did it store? So this is what it did, right? So it did the permutation 1,000 times. So these are all your features, 6,197, whatever we filtered. Index means what's the position of these features originally from 1 to 1,600, 70 or whatever, right? So this is your test statistics that was originally collected. That test statistic resulted in your raw p value. Raw p is your original uh, um, test statistics, which is the uh, the one with parametric assumption. Adjusted p is what happened after you do the permutation uh, or your uh, uh, max t method that you did here, right? So this is all that it did. It took your original raw value and it adjusted this. In this particular scenario, there has been no adjustment, but I think in the tail Right, so you had a raw p-value of, let's say, 0.994, and you adjust it to slightly higher, which is 1. But if you look into the middle, you'll see some of the raw p-value, which was 0 0.03, got adjusted to 0 0.07, etc., etc. So if you look at the data set on its entirety, you'll see how the raw p-value is a higher one, and your adjusted p-value is a lower one. 
So now the question comes that do you want to now extract your features based on your assumption of normal parametric t-test, which is then you can do it by raw p. But if you want to go a step further and you say, you know, that raw p is that something I don't want to rely on, I think I'm going to get better confidence if I do this adjusted p. So then you're going to sort this adjusted p. And if you have a criteria of only getting those features that has a p-value less than 0 0.01, so in this case, all this first six one will show up anyway. So this is already adjusted by by raw by AGPay, so you don't have to sort it. But I'll show you how to sort it anyway. So let's say you want to get the hundredth element. How do you do that? So the hundredth element is very easy from this frame. You just access the hundred one. The raw p value is 0 0.001. Okay. Or maybe the thousandth element. Let's say the five hundred adjusted p. 0.997. Okay. So if you want to order uh, something by index, it's, it's irrelevant. You don't want to order something by index. I'm not going to bother showing that. But order something by adjusted p-values. So everything, it's already ordered, but if you want to, order. So you can just do rest t dollar adjusted p by dollar. So rest t is your data frame. So rest t dollar adjusted p will give you that. And all you have to put is an order around it. And you already did that on your homework the first homework that you did. You know how to access a particular column and sort it. So this should not be, um, this should be rather very easy for you to do. Okay. So now if I want to uh, actually get the uh, names, the features, uh, names of the features, right? So remember your expression set object, a, so ALLS2 is an expression set object. It has different method. One of the method did you show early, which is p data, gives you the phenodata object. There's another method called feature names. Feature names gives you, if you apply this method, gives you all the names of the features that, that you have. So if you now do this, you, you get all the feature. If you, the, all you're interested is on the names of the adjusted p values, and you want to get those feature names that, ha that met this adjusted p value order then you can use this function. And if you want to look at it, the first few ones, so these are the feature names. So there you made the transition from your adjusted p-value of 0 0.001, then how do you go to the feature name, which is also actually over here too. Okay. So if I want to know how many of these features that I have, which is 1,617, that met a criteria of p-value less than 0.05, very simple. I just do this. Adjusted p-value less than 0 0.05 and give me the index of those particular. In this case, if you want to get the from the index to feature, I also show you there. So you have 157, 54, 56, 57, 58. 158 features that meets your criteria of, of adjusted p-value less than 0 0.05. So then what you would want to do at the end of it, that you want to probably map the feature names. In this case, you're only seeing the index. right? That's the way I wrote the code. But I, you can also show these. That meets the criteria of p-value less than 0 0.05. Then you, and once you get the feature names, the next thing you want to do, and probably all of you are reading chapter 4. You probably finished reading. You're reading chapter, lecture 5 now, which is how do you go from feature name to annotation to know what's the gene name. And then I can show you that also in a bit. So in order for you to uh, to um, um, enable the annotation, just so you know which feature. So how do you know which feature, this feature 413119, how do you know which gene it belongs to? The way you do that, you would call this library HU95AB2DB. Right? So this library actually enables you to link your feature to the, uh, uh, to the annotation or, or, or gene name. And the way the function that you use, so this is for accession number, but let me show you the gene name, is you want to use the feature name function of your ALL3. And the second parameter that you want to give is you want to convert the feature name into the gene name. So this is the parameter, AGU95AV2 gene name. If you're using a different uh, um, uh, b platform or, or a c a CDF file or, or array type, you're going to get HGU133A in that case, if that's, if that's the platform that you're using. 
Remember from our annotation, we already know that for our ALL data sales, it's actually done on HGU95 AV2 version of the chip. That's why I actually imported this chip, because depending on the version of the array chip type that you're using, your mapping of your feature to the to the gene name is going to be different, because when first AFI came up with these features uh, and the, the annotation, much has been learned about the genome and different genes, uh, so we have much more wealth of information. But more important than that, to your, to your context of analysis, you should always make sure you, you're using the correct chip type and you're putting the correct annotation. Otherwise, you're going to get a totally incorrect uh, result or analysis. So quality is, is, is a key anytime you do any kind of data analysis. So very simple function, right? So this will actually give you all the gene names. So now if you look at it, so these are all the genes. So this is what I think everybody gets started getting excited for those of you who are biologists. So what are those 153 protein gene names uh, that are that are interested in this particular cancer study? So you can just see, you know, some of these uh, interleukin, CD3 molecule, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can also sort it uh, based on the p-value that you have. Uh, so that's the ultimate connection that you're trying to make. Your, you know, these are the gene names that are highly differentially expressed between SCRABL mutation and the negative mutation. And then you can even take step further, not now in the course, but we will take in the later. You can connect it to a network or a known pathway. So much to come in the class. Should you should you keep be interested in this? So how many of these genes are duplicated so we can do all that? So one thing I want to show you very quickly is let's do a heat map now. And this is uh, something of a topic that will be very interested to you soon. So let's when we do a heat map, and I want to explain to you what a heat map is. What the heat map did right here, it plotted all the uh, samples, which is the 49 samples. So you have your SCR, ABL sample. Uh, I took some note here. Okay, so ALLF4 has 10 samples. Sorry, you know, when I actually, my apologies, did this experiment, it's between ALLF4 and uh, um, and um, BCRABL. I did not do it between BCRABL and NEG. I actually showed you how to do the BCRABL and NEG extraction, but the data set that I used was actually between ALLF and BCRABL, which was, uh, that's what the confusion was, and I just didn't change my code, because BCRABL and negative is 79 samples, but if you consider just this one and BCRABL, there's 37 samples. But anyway, so I ended up analyzing actually BCRABL, which is this 37 samples, and ALLF41, which is 10 samples, so your samples are on this axis, and the 157 features that met your p-value criteria of 0 0.05 are actually on this axis, right? So now this is, gets interesting. Now you do your heat map or plotting, you'll see for this feature, maybe this, so you have five distinct uh, cluster here. So you have a pattern here where this is blue and this is green. This is green, that's blue. This is green, blue, red. I'm colorblind, blue and green, and then maybe on this one slightly green, blue, blue, green. So one, two, three, four, five. So visually I can see there are five different clusters here. So then the question is, you know, between this sample and that sample, I can definitely see that this group of genes, let's say this is upregulated, but the for this sample this is downregulated. For this sample, this group of genes is downregulated, but vice versa is almost upregulated, right? So upregulated, downregulated, down, up, up, down. So you will know, you know, which color is up or which color is down, but but that's the basic idea. So when you plot this heat map against the sample, against the features, and you look at this color, many times on the experiments, you it, it's, you don't get such a clear distinction. But if you do an experiment and you have see a, such an obvious difference between colors where you see a clear pattern, where this is definitely blue and this set of samples, the gene is definitely uh, uh, green, that means because of this mutation, maybe it's blocking a pathway where the genes are not getting expressed. So that's a key and a very significant finding. right? So once you have these kind of capabilities and you have access to public data, 
and your interest pursues you, so you're doing this analysis and you come up with such findings, that could be a gold mine that, that you're finding, my opinion. Okay, so 7.40, um, I think the last 20 minutes I want to spend, and your future homeworks, when we get into clustering and others, I can show you how to exactly extract out of the heat map those five different blocks and how you interdependently understand these clusters and find out the features that belongs to that cluster. So your homework five, is it homework three, four? I think homework four or homework five, one or the other, will talk a lot about clustering but you probably get a snapshot of it right now. So dendrogram and cluster and label, so uh, I'm not going to get into it today. <clears throat> Finally, what I want to now introduce you is the SAM. Uh, the SAM is the FDR based control, which is the, uh, the I just forgot the name, which is S plus S0 that I did. Um, and I think it was This one explains all the uh, theory, the, the exchangeability factor, right, S0. So this slide, take a look. Again, gives you all the theory of how t SAM is, and read the paper by Tushar et al. So how do you do SAM? To SAM, we want to use the Cygnus package. Again, remember always to get your bioconductor. Any package, be connected to online, so you do that. And any package that you're interested specifically, so for my case, for it would be Cygnus. So that's our right inside. So get BioC, and inside the parameter, you type Cygnus. It'll, get, it'll give you the Cygnus package in your computer. So now that I already have the Cygnus package, and this time I'm going to work with the ALL package, which I already uploaded first, so it's not going to matter. And so I import this Cygnus package. And uh, I don't do actually any filter here, so I'm not going to show you. But in your homework, I might tell you do a filter, non-specific filter based on IQR of 0.8 and etc. Greater than 0.8. So let's not do that. Um, let's see how I wrote it. Okay. So I, I imported the gene filter function, but I am not going to do any non-specific filtering this time. I should, but for me showing you how to do things, it shouldn't matter what I choose to do or not. Just want to, to introduce you to the core functionalities. That's my intent here. So what I want to do is P data sub all gives you the pheno data, right? So you can already see that your mold or biology I already showed you earlier gives you the BCR, ABL and negative and all that. If you want to understand more about the Vignette and how actually I followed it or how I constructed this tutorial and how the user and how do you practice the code? I already talked about it. So don't ever forget the hip Vignet. Open the Vignet and see the documentation. You can issue the help command on Cygnus, and it will give you more direction, you know, how this package has been written, uh, and, and, and etc. I might want to do that. <clears throat> okay. So up to all this page you have seen before. Now, in before, when we did the malt t test package, and let's back up for a second, there were three parameters, and the SAM package will be pretty much similar. There'll be three parameters that you need to give inside the mal, uh, SAM package to understand, to, to get it running. So this was the malt t package. There's two methods, empty.minp and empty.maxt. I'm here using empty.maxt. In your homework, I might ask you to do empty.minp. So three parameters, right? The, your matrix or, or, or asset data, your class label, and B. So over here, I showed you the construction of class label, where I did the CL, where I told you where the data type was a BCR ABL, right? Or mall dot, at mall dot bio. So anything else that was met the criteria became one, and anything else was zero. So for SAM, you also need to construct a class label. But uh, I just show you a slightly different way of, of constructing the class level. It's up to you how you want to do the class level. You know, you can even do the class level very simply by a collection. To say X, CL is equal to collection of 11100001. One, 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 zero, 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 one. Don't, don't try to get fancy on certain things if, you, if there is no need for it. Not that I'm trying to be fancy here. But I'm just trying to show you different ways that probably something was in Vignet, and I tried to explain to you that way. So in this condition, wherever the mole.bio is BCR negative, assign a class level of 0. If mole.bio is this, then class level is 0, else 1. That was the if-else function does. Right? Very simple. 
So this is your class label. So let me assign it there. And then I can look it up. And this is my class label of my 40, uh, whatever, nine samples, etc. 70. Yeah. In this case, CLLL1. Okay. 41, 47 samples. Okay. So then, I, the second parameter that I want to give, it has to be casted as an expression set objects as a data type. It, it, because it doesn't care about phenodet and all that. So the way to cast it is you do an expression set. So we do that. Oops, sorry. And let's do a dimension of that. So I have 79 samples, okay, and I have 2,391 features. So if I want to look at some rows and columns, and you can practice it at home, you know, when I upload it. So these are the three parameters that, uh, four parameters actually, Sam has. One is a random number, which based on which it will do the permutation. I say one, two, three, four, five. You can give whatever you want. Var dot equal equals to true. So do a help and figure out what var dot equal does. But I would say you keep it as true. The second parameter is supply the class labels, just like the way I did for a, for a multi test package. And the sub all is the expression set object uh, as a data that I casted here. So sub all is just a matrix with features and rows at the samples at columns. So that's all you need to do for to initiate the SAM. So look at inside what the parameters are. This will be the data set or expression set that you constructed. Class table, you can simply construct by a collection. I showed you by if else. This is a random number seed. You can look up what var dot equal to two to, to does. And we can discuss it when we do our homework solution. So let the, now SAM will run just like the way a malt t test package run for the FWER. But in this case with the SAM, I'm actually doing an FDR. And there's some optimization and some parameters to be chosen. So make sure you pay some attention at the end of this class so that will help you to do the homework. You can look out at the structure of SAM, but I'm not going to get into that. And what are the slots it has. We can discuss a little more depth of this in the homework. So I want to make sure in the last few minutes that you actually now know how to run SAM. So to initiate SAM, what did you do? You give the, gave the parameters that you needed to. So that's the first attention that you need to give in your homework. What's the, what's the matrix? What's the class level? And these two you can keep the same or change it if you want the random number. It wouldn't make a difference. Then look at your out one over here. So what out one is telling, you have your delta test statistics. These are the different deltas. At these deltas, you had uh, 1,700 genes, right, at this delta is false positive, And you had 1,987 genes that are true positive. So at this rate, you have a 50% FDR. So that's a very high FDR rate. So even though you get 1,987 genes that are correct, but what Sam is telling you, you have a likelihood of 1,700 genes that will be false positive, or you'll have an error. So you don't want to take this delta. So now, out of this table, it, you take a look at it and see what's most relevant. So I would probably take a delta of, of 1.4, because at this delta, what's happening, I'm getting 101 genes that are true positive, called, means I have a high confidence or a total confidence, whatever you want to call it, that these 101 genes, based on the random permutation and everything that I did, truly stands out. So I'm telling you with utmost confidence that 101 genes are true if you choose a delta of uh, 1.4. But you have a likelihood of three genes to be called false or false positive. So now it's you up to as an investigator to say, can you tolerate uh, that error rate? Are you satisfied with three genes being called false? So if you do that, the tolerance level or proportion, the false discovery rate, rate is the proportion that you're, to, that you're willing to tolerate is 2%. But if you're more stringent, that I want not even one to be false, I want maybe, I have a tolerance level of 0 0.999, you know, 0.00001%. 
So if you have a very strict criteria, then you probably get only 19 genes that are called totally positive. So you go down, so again, you're losing power, right? The more criteria you want to throw you into your noise, the, the less power that you'll have. So in this case, you're going down from 101 genes to 19 genes. But you just have less than one gene that is called false. So then, so basically, if you want to have total confidence, then it will not happen. You can only get nine genes that with a total confidence, but and you have no tolerance. What I mean by not happen means you have no tolerance for any error rate. So if you choose a delta of 2.7, nine genes really stands out. So maybe it's worth looking into because when you look at those nine genes, what it's saying with, with that I'm a total confidence that they're totally significant, and I will have no error when I give you these two nine genes. Or if you want to look at more genes, then you have to have more tolerance, which is 2% FDR. In that case, you will get 3.3 errors, but you get 109 genes. So then you have to ask the biological question, that are you OK with working with 100 genes and see what kind of biological significance you get? Or are you OK with working with 9 genes that are totally, truly differentially expressed. But when you look at the biology, you say, yeah, I know it will always be differentially expressed because that's how the biology works. But it doesn't tell me anything about this mutation or the cancer that I'm trying to study. So whatever you're telling me about these nine genes, you're getting very excited with your bioconductor program and your analysis technique. But I already know it, it as a biologist, and it doesn't mean anything to me. So then you may be asked to redo it. Or then, then you go back to more power, which is 100 genes, and probably there's a likelihood it will have some findings that will be significant in what we are trying to do. So that's pretty much it. Um, and I, there is one slide. Um, um, I don't want to show it now. Maybe, maybe I do. Um, it's an optimization of when you lower your delta, you get more genes, right? So if you lower your delta, you get more genes called. And if you up your delta, you actually uh, get uh, less genes. Uh, so this is an optimization. So based on this observe D, which is the line, this is a visual representation of what we're doing. The delta bar, right, I think it's called um, delta bar, right. So this is the width here right now between this and this. So if you increase the width here, right, so this is going, this line is going to go up. So if right now, as is, you have one, two, three, six genes that are differentially expressed, up, down regulated, and let's say ten genes that's up regulated. So if you increase your criteria, your bar is going to go up. So instead of having one, two, three, four, five, if the line is up to here, you might get only four instead of six. So it's a optimization thing. So if you increase the width here, you're going to get less power or I mean less delta no, or less different number of genes that are called true positive and if you decrease your delta here then you're going to end up having more genes that are differentially expressed so there is no right answer wrong answer uh, it's it's an optimization you you do the analysis you look at your table you see you know what you know what, what tables that you that what numbers that you're getting and for each of these number you produce a subset of features or genes. And then, if you're the biologist, you end up doing more analysis. Or if you're lucky enough, like me, I'm not a biologist, you hand over the data and tell him or her, good luck. Let me know how it goes. And let me know if I need to do another round. Anyway, 7.53, nice talking to you guys. And next week, I probably will, most likely, I will not be able to hold the web session since I'm out in training. So I would like to reschedule it on Sunday. And uh, good luck uh, doing your um, homework uh, too, which is due on Wednesday.